as he said, the cutting edge of versioning. I'm Chris Kreitcho. So we're going to talk about semantic versioning, library and framework evolution, programming language design, type systems, and most importantly, what you should do with all of this. So a tiny little bit about me. I've been doing this for about 15 years now, in which time I have done everything from writing avionics software or what happens when things explode in a, an oil refinery to working most recently as the tech lead for LinkedIn's web app and currently working on new materials for the Rust programming language book. And when I was at LinkedIn, I spent, for good and for ill, a lot of time thinking about versioning, versioning libraries, et cetera, and how that interacts with and intersects with programming languages, frameworks, library design, et cetera. So let's get into it. When we come out of here today, I'm hoping you'll know a little more about three things. First, what is versioning? Which might seem obvious, but it's going to be important. Second, what does it look like to take versioning seriously as a kind of programming? And finally, what should you be doing as a programmer who is inevitably using versioning? So let's start with that first question. What is versioning? Versioning is a communication tool. And specifically, it's a communication tool for telling people that something has changed. Maybe it got some new features, maybe it got support for a new OS, or drop support for an old OS. Maybe it fixed an annoying bug that has been costing me time and work. But in short, versioning gives us a way of communicating so that we can answer questions like, does the upgrade get me something I want? And am I willing to pay for it? And willing to pay for it, if you're talking about some commercial app, it might just be literally, am I willing to pay for it? But in a lot of cases for us, we're thinking about, am I willing to sink the engineering cost of doing an upgrade or not? With that in mind, let's talk about some versioning strategies. How do people actually go about communicating? We will start with the elephant in the room. Semver semantic versioning is sort of the de facto standard for the past decade, and I think for a good reason. So a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but again, let's make sure everybody's on the same page. Semver gives us a version specifier with five possible slots of information, major, minor, patch, and optionally pre-release, and optionally some metadata. None of that was actually new to Semver, it turns out. What was new is that it gave specific names and specific semantics to each of those slots of information. Lots of people have used versioning schemes like that for decades and decades before Semver showed up 13, 14 years ago. But we know now, if we're using Semver, that that five is called major, the two is called minor, and the patch, the three, is called a patch version in 5.2.3. And if we tacked dash beta dot one plus fun onto the end of it, then we know it's a pre-release for 5.2 to 3, the first beta of it, and some fun metadata, which means whatever you want it to mean. And that was actually a surprisingly big win because versioning being a communication tool, having common language makes it a lot easier to communicate effectively about what we're saying. And secondly, as I said a moment ago, it gave those things, those names, and therefore those slots, semantics. So a patch version means the only thing here should be backwards compatible bug fixes. And a minor version means the only thing here is deprecations, features, or maybe some bug fixes that should be backwards compatible. A major version tells you breaking changes. Look out, pay attention. Maybe also these other things. And then the pre-release and metadata give you what they sound like. And a lot of the talk is actually going to be about the nuances of this scheme. And specifically, some of the, the difficulties that Semver has. Because after all, what is a bug and what is a breaking change? Uh, if I fixed a bug and it broke your code, is it actually a breaking change? Or for that matter, does it count if I published a change and the public API didn't change, but the performance characteristics radically changed. Maybe it went from O of one access on a collection to O of N or 
good grief, O of n squared. So it's hard to call that not a breaking change, but maybe the public API didn't promise performance and you shouldn't have been relying on it. These kinds of dynamics are inherent to trying to give semantics to our versioning. You end up arguing about whether something is or isn't a breaking change, is or isn't a bug fix. And in communities which care a bunch about Semver and also don't think too highly of themselves, sometimes you will hear the phrase Semver lawyering to kind of make fun of this dynamic, right? There's some good stuff in Semver. We're going to talk a lot about it today. But also, these are challenging issues. And so some people say, eh, skip all the arguing, just increment a number. Uh, Solover is maybe the most famous of these. They say on the homepage, we intentionally do not try to communicate backwards compatibility, as there is no objective in satisfying definition anyways. As a provider, you should document changes properly. As a user, you should test anyways. I actually agree with those last two sentences, as we'll see over the rest of the talk. But it turns out that all of these kinds of just one number Approaches also say, ah, but you could slap a dash beta 1 and dash beta 2 on the end of it because it turns out that the major minor patch trio and all those other things emerged for a reason. They communicate something. Just one version doesn't actually communicate something. You have to put that somewhere else. Another non-sember alternative is date-based versioning, like Calver. Dates always go up. Some of you are saying that's not technically true. It's true enough for versioning, OK? Uh, there are a couple common variations on this that you likely will see in the world, like four-digit four year and two-digit month, so it's May 2024, 2024.05, or what you might think of as the Ubuntu style, two-digit year, two-digit month, so 24.05. And usually people doing this still have patches, so you can have 24.05.1 and 24.05.2. And this is actually useful in a lot of ways. Knowing when something came out is really helpful. But it doesn't tell you any semantics. You still just have to go read the release notes. Because what's in 24.05 versus 24.03? I don't know. <laughs> go read the release notes, right? The last alternative we're going to talk about is what I jokingly call TypeScript ver, or just count to nine. Uh, TypeScript uses a versioning scheme that looks like Semver, including that you can have patches that go as high as you want. But the, the minor version starts at 1.0 and counts upward until you hit 1.9 and then 2.0, because you got to 9 and the next number is 10, and that couldn't go in a version. Uh, this is actually fine, and it could be compatible with Semver. You would just know that you were going to bundle up all your breaking changes every 10 releases. Cool. But that's not what TypeScript does with this. TypeScript introduces breaking changes in what the rest of the ecosystem calls minor releases. And honestly, if TypeScript were its own ecosystem, fine. You can define your versioning scheme how you want. But TypeScript isn't its own versioning, isn't its own ecosystem. It lives in NPM, where everything thinks in Semver. So this is a pain in the neck, because all the tools don't understand it. So why does TypeScript do this? There are two reasons that the Microsoft team behind TypeScript has told us. One is marketing. Muckety mucks at Microsoft have said, you need to have big bang releases every you know, .9 to 2.0. The 1.9 to 2.0 was the one where they did this first. And you know what? Funding programming language development is really hard. When people give you a budget and they tell you how to do your versioning as part of the marketing, OK. <laughs> you take the money and you fund your programming language development. And again, it's not a problem for Semver. But number two is philosophy. The TypeScript team says, and they're not totally wrong here, that technically, basically any change you make to a compiler is breaking, because somebody's code somewhere stopped type checking almost any time. Somebody's code stopped compiling almost any time. And this is more interesting to me. It is, again, in some non-trivial sense, true. But it doesn't actually persuade me. <laughs> and I think this is a really good spot to talk a little bit about philosophy when it comes to versioning. Let's talk about Hiram's law from Hiram Wright at Google, who said, with a sufficient number of users of an API, it does not matter what you promise in the contract. All observable behaviors of your system will be depended on by somebody. And this is what the TypeScript team is getting at with a compiler in particular. 
any change they make makes someone's code somewhere stop compiling. That includes bug fixes, because some stuff that was type checking shouldn't have been. It also includes a lot of features, because TypeScript is types for JavaScript, and JavaScript is full of shenanigans. So when they add a new feature to catch more of those cases, like nullability checking, well, everyone who upgrades to that version suddenly sees a whole lot more red squiggles in their, or in their editor and a lot more compiler errors. Now, those were there before. They were just invisible. They showed up at runtime as undefined is not a function. But nonetheless, your code stopped compiling. Compilers for gradually typed languages are maybe a particularly pathological case of this issue. But it's actually common everywhere in my experience. So today, LinkedIn.com, which I worked on for almost five years, is a very large Ember.js app, a couple million lines of code, including the app and the tests. And Ember tries harder than anybody else in the JavaScript ecosystem to be really good at backwards compatibility. It's like the selling point for the framework. And every single time we would do a minor backwards compatible upgrade of Ember at LinkedIn, on the order of 20,000 out of our 30,000 tests would fail every time, without exception. And inevitably, the reason was things like, oh, we accidentally, implicitly, unknowingly depended on the order that these two internal async framework functions resolved in. And now we have to update the app to account for that. All observable behaviors of the system will be depended on by someone. Hiram says a sufficient number of users. In my experience, the number is very, very low, like tens, maybe a few dozen. Uh, people just do use your software in ways you won't expect. And it's kind of easy to see how that happens at you know, LinkedIn with hundreds of developers making dozens of commits amounting to millions of lines of code a day, or, or not a day, thank goodness, millions of lines of code total. But also, I have a TypeScript library I maintain with a friend that has 2,340 lines of code, including the tests. And I've made internal refactors for performance that were totally backwards compatible and had some of my dozens of users show up and say, hey, you broke us. <laughs> dozens, OK, OK. So Hiram's law is, I think, real in some sense. But I don't think that means we have to give up on using versioning to communicate semantics, because versioning is a communication tool. Think back through those versions, for versioning schemes for a minute. Each of them communicates something. So Semver is trying to tell us what kinds of changes happened here. What are the semantics of it? Calver tells us when the changes happened, which again is useful. Solover tells us things happened. Good, cool, I'll read the release notes. TypeScript tells us the decimal system happened. That last one gets at the key issue to me. When the TypeScript team chooses to use the same numbering scheme to communicate something different from what the rest of the ecosystem they're in is communicating, that's confusing. It'd be like if I chose to use the word blue to mean green like the floor in here. And every time you heard me say blue, now you have to translate to green. That's just confusing. They don't have to do that. But maybe even more importantly, I think their philosophical point, while sort of true, also misses something important. And that is, what kind of communication does versioning represent? And Semver in particular. I think it represents a contract. And more to the point, a socio-technical contract. Contracts are communication tools. They are designed to help us navigate and sometimes even adjudicate ambiguities, like is this a bug or a breaking change? And it's socio-technical because in the case of versioning, it's a thing that can, at least, sit at the intersection of people and computers. It's not purely social, and it's not purely technical. Also note, though, that it's often implicit, and implicit gets you in trouble. Because, well, one of the ways you can tell it's a contract is that when you break it, implicit or not, your users get really mad at you. And I will say, partial credit to the TypeScript team here, their contract is clear and it is coherent. I just think it's wrong. <laughs> um, 
And they don't have to do it, even on their own terms. They could, after all, say, here's our contract. Catching new kinds of type errors that we, sorry, catching errors we didn't catch before but we should have is a bug fix. Adding new strictness settings is a feature, as long as we don't opt you into them, and bundling them in so they're part of the default, that's a breaking change. That would be all they have to do. They could define the contract in those terms. Because everyone understands, as a rule, that bug fixes can, quote unquote, break existing code. And we're OK living with that as long as we understand the contract. And likewise, we get opt-in changes being features and uh, breaking changes, including things like updating defaults. And it would be more work for the TypeScript team, but it would be doable. And I think this goes for Hiram's law more generally. The law is true so far as it goes, but honestly, I think if you're not in a, a Google or Meta-style mono repo, the consequences aren't that bad. You articulate your policy clearly, you do your best to live by it, and you deal with the hard cases when they come up. And it's mostly fine, because in versioning, as in actual legal contracts, hard cases make for bad law. Deal with them as the one-offs that they usually actually are. The last note here is that contracts in the legal world are things we try to enforce. What would it look like to try to enforce a socio-technical contract? I think we call that programming. Programming is always trying to encode instructions for a computer and encode semantics and meaning for humans to understand, even if the humans are me a week from now and a year from now and so on, but usually a broader audience. So to that second question, what does it look like to take versioning seriously as a kind of programming? I think, for starters, we need some basic rules. We need to define our versioning in a machine-readable way, and gladly, all of these that we saw earlier would work for that. It's just parsing some numbers and maybe some extra text, fine. Two, we need to give semantics to those. I think this puts us in the camp called Semver, because the other ones don't have that. Uh, other versioning schemes have to use side channels, like release notes. And you can parse release notes, but at that point I'm saying, why aren't you just using the version number if you're putting the same info in your release notes? And then lastly, we need to, and this is the hard part, map the kinds of changes we've made to our code over time into those semantics. So let's talk about it. And the hard one here is defining breaking changes. So the shorthand I like to use for thinking about what is breaking or not is actually to go back to Postel's law from the development of TCP. Be conservative in what you do, be liberal in what you accept from others. If you translate that into what you do with an API over time, you have a useful mental model for what is not breaking and what is breaking. And I'm going to talk through this here in terms of functions, because I think that's the easiest to get your head around. But the same thing tends to go for defining data structures or things like that. So if I'm a function and I make a change that accepts some looser set of input, that's not breaking in general. So if I used to require you to give me integers between 1 and 100, and now I say, oh, it's fine, you can give me any positive integer, well, great, all of your calls to this function keep working, and you can make some more now. Backwards compatible, we win, feature. On the other hand, if I do the opposite, I used to accept any positive integer, and now I say it must be between 1 and 100, or I will throw an exception, whoops, <laughs> I just broke a lot of calling code, most likely. And the inverse is true for the kinds of things that a function returns for basically the same reason. If I now provide stricter output, well, all of your calling code already had to handle a wider range of cases. If I used to give you positive integers and now I only give you 1 to 100, none of your code will break because of that. But vice versa. If I used to promise positive integers and now I hand you 0, well, any code that you were doing which did division might break. Whoops. So there's the inversion there. And then the last thing we can see is that adding a new API is, in general, not a breaking change. Uh, there are ways you can cause things to break doing this, but they usually mean you were doing shenanigans, barrel imports, or things like that. Avoid doing that, and you don't get broken. But by the same token, you remove an existing public API. Well, that's kind of the classic definition of a breaking change. Anybody who is calling that can't call it anymore. 
I wrote a semverse spec. We'll see a little bit of it later for TypeScript types. This summary elides many important details, and those details may surprise you. That's the right mental model, but actually applying it and getting into the nitty gritty, we'll see a few of these as we go now. It's hard. <laughs> uh, but with those things in place and thinking hard about it in the context of whatever our language is, we actually could start trying to programmatically check it. The default mode, though, is not to, <laughs> and to go with vibes. And I'm borrowing that from Richard Feldman and Louis Milford, who were talking about versioning in Rock and Gleam recently, and described it this way, and not pejoratively. Uh, if versioning is only about communicating with humans, then something is a bug fix or a breaking change really does come down a lot of times to how it feels. Maybe I could lawyer my way to saying, this thing is just a bug fix, but if it feels like it's gonna break all my users, maybe I just go ahead and own that and say, this is breaking, even if it were technically just a bug fix. I'm not satisfied with this as the entirety of what we do, but I do think this is actually important to keep as part of the recipe for that reason. Maybe this thing is just a bug fix. But I reserve the right to say, it's a really big bug fix that's gonna break 90% of my users, this is breaking. So I don't think we should limit ourselves to feelings and judgments and vibes, but we should certainly include them in the mix. The next thing we might do is think about tests. Uh, the first communities that really took Semver seriously were Ruby and Node, and they both have pretty strong testing cultures because they're dynamically typed languages, and that's the tool you have, the only tool you have, and it's a good tool. But one of the things they learned is that if you have a well-specified public API, then changing your tests and a well-covered public API, critically, changing your tests always tells you something. Failing tests, when you make a change, tells you that either there's a bug because you caused a regression or you've made a breaking change. You changed some contract that you were promising before. New tests, as a rule, mean you made a bug fix and you're preventing regressions or that you added a feature. And removed tests generally should tell you that you removed deprecated code. I'm going to ignore flaky tests that we deleted for flakiness, but that would be the other reason. And tests also can tell us things about performance or end-to-end -end relationships. I suggested that O of one to O of N kind of change earlier. Benchmarks could help us catch that kind of thing. Uh, they might also help us catch some of those gnarly timing semantic issues we would run into uh, in our upgrades of Ember at LinkedIn, right? But they only give you so much. Number one, you only get coverage on this kind of thing for what you actually have test coverage for. And number two, it's kind of hard to test against this, to, to check this in a programmatic way. To do that, you need to actually basically write an interpreter or some kind of static analysis that can go actually inspect all of your tests. And good luck if you've written some dry tests which have a lot of kinds of abstractions to make it easier to do things. It's very hard to do that. It's possible and maybe useful if you're in one of those languages, but another tool that might be better suited to it is types. Because types exist fundamentally to communicate the contract for a piece of code to a computer and to humans. So they're really good at this thing that we're asking Semver to do. Now they don't cover everything, but they can cover a lot of things really usefully. So I'll start with Elm, which for six or seven years now, at least I think, has made it the case that when you do Elm bump to increment the version of your package, Elm runs the compiler against the previous version and your current version, and based on what changes, it will say, oh, this can be a patch because there's no breaking changes, cool, it must be a bug fix. Or it'll say, this must be a minor because you added a new API. Or it will say, you changed an existing API or you removed one. So this is by definition a major version. That's really, really cool and really powerful. But it only happens at the type level. Thinking about the vibes and testing dynamics, it's not gonna catch a performance change, et cetera. So we still need to be able to use our judgment and apply some of those other techniques, but this is really, really helpful because it just automates a lot of the work. I don't have to go think about, did I make a breaking change in this? It, Elm says, you did. Rust wants to do the same thing because it also cares very seriously about Semver, 
bakes it into its version resolution, and the cargo team has documented in great, one might say excruciating detail, uh, look at the size of that scroll thumb. You can't even see it on here because it's so small. But this is about a 10,000 word document about how Semver compatibility works in Rust. Um, and there is currently nothing quite like Elm that's baked in for everybody, but there's a tool called Cargo Semver Checks by Predrod Grusky, which if you're using Rust, you should use this. And it's working to catch up on those 10,000 words, but it's hard both because there's a lot to cover and because of the way it's bolted on. So why is there a lot to cover? Well, one is that Rust is complicated. Let me show you a very, very simple example of ways that you have to check things and then explain that the hard versions that we're not going to talk about because we don't have time are much, 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 much harder than this. Here's an example Rust module that defines a person, which has a name and an age field on it. And you can just define this even from outside that module. Let me be an example person whose name is a string, Chris, and whose age is 36, because everything is public there. If, in a later version, I add this ID field, that is a breaking change, because I can no longer name that from outside that module. Rust will very politely tell me, I can't do this, there's private fields, and you don't have any way to give me that private field. So now I need to make a public constructor or something like that. The point is, this is a breaking change. And it's relatively straightforward to see, and thankfully cargo sember checks can catch it. Things get a little harder when you start thinking about generics and lifetimes and module scopes and associated types and traits and all the ways those interact. So cargo sember checks is getting there, but there's a fundamental challenge for it, which is also that it's bolted on. Elm could just say, oh, I'm gonna invoke the compiler directly and do this check. And it could do that because Elm package and Elm compiler are both written by Evan Chaplicki and he's in charge of all of it. Rust has dozens of contributors. They don't want a stable public API for the compiler. They can't do that. So Cargo Semver Checks is bolted onto Rust's documentation infrastructure. We'll come back to that. For the moment, let's move on to TypeScript. Elm and Rust have very different difficulties because Elm is a tiny little language, and Rust is a large language. And that makes a big difference because the more complicated your type system is, the harder checking Semver is. As I learned when I wrote SemverTS.org, this is a document which makes the cargo Semver checks one look short because the TypeScript type system is so very complicated. Here's just one of the challenges. Again, there are harder ones. So JavaScript's collection types are all mutable. And TypeScript has local type inference. And it has untagged union types, like let x be a value which is a string or a number. When you put those together, it breaks the heuristics I taught you earlier. Uh, so here's a function, example, which just returns a string or a number. The body doesn't matter. If I use this to construct my array, using array literal syntax, the type of my array is an array of string or number. Cool. And arrays are mutable in JavaScript, so I can push in one, two, three, or I can push in hello, and both of those type check just fine. Great. This is JavaScripty as it can be. Now, in the mental model I gave you earlier, changing this to return a stricter type should be fine, because all your existing code should still type check, right? Our rule was stricter output is legal. But when we combine this with inference and untagged unions, my array is now an array of number, not of a number and string. And so pushing in hello no longer works. And these kinds of examples are pervasive in TypeScript's type system because of the way it's modeling JavaScript. And again, this is a nice, easy example. <laughs> Uh, it turns out that there are effectively no API changes you can make in TypeScript which are guaranteed to be backward compatible all the time. None. And you can work around this. You can s explicitly tell people, hey, if you want to not be broken, explicitly annotate all your types, but that stinks. Type, annotate, type inference is nice, actually. But again, it's indicative. The more kinds of things your language allows at that type level, 
the harder it is to write a checker for it, which is why I haven't written a checker for it in TypeScript like Cargo Semver checks. Let's talk about something pretty different. Let's look at Unison, which is a pure functional programming language, and it has a host of interesting features. Got an effect system, does distributed computing like Erlang in really interesting ways. It's worth your time. The relevant bit for our purposes today is that Unison code doesn't get stored as plain text. You write it as plain text, and then you run the Unison Code Manager tool, and it checks you know, whatever little scratch file you have there, and you can say UCM add, and it'll save that definition for a function or a type or whatever. And when you do that, it does a lot of the things that other programming languages do. It'll type check it, it'll do code gen, but it also generates an AST, which is normal, normalizes the AST into a canonical form, which is not very normal, hashes the normalized AST, which is getting super not normal. Like, you might hash the input to avoid redoing work, but you normalize the, hash the normalized AST? Yes, because then you're going to save the hash, the normalized AST, and the name to an SQLite database. And that's how you, Unison code gets stored. This has a lot of interesting consequences, but what it means specifically is that when you reference that name, under the hood, Unison maps that back to the hash, and therefore, to that normalized definition. And what falls out of this is a really neat property. No upgrade can ever break any of your code. Because when you get a new version of a library, your code is still referencing the hash pointing to that old definition. This is content addressed code. And what, when you combine that with it being a pure functional language, it means it literally can't break you. These things can't muck with each other. And you get to upgrade incrementally as you go. You can say, okay, this definition, I'm now going to update to use the new signature. But I don't have to touch any of the other definition, uh, other uses of this particular function. I can do them one at a time, as makes sense. Now, I think you still want ecosystem and company norms about how you do upgrades, because you could actually end up with a worse problem with tech debt from this, if not, where you have a mixed state for a much longer period of time. I mean, the upside here is there's no, nothing forcing you to do your breaking change all at once. The downside is there's nothing forcing you to do a breaking change upgrade all at once. You can do it as slowly as you want. But it lets you upgrade incrementally in a way that's very difficult for most other ecosystem strategies. The very cutting edge here is baking versions in as part of your type system. When I was trying to understand how to make TypeScript's types and Semver get along a few years ago, I went looking for research, thinking, please let there be something out there to help me with this. And there was not. But since then, uh, the good folks at Nova University of Lisbon have started doing some interesting work here. And in a paper called A Deep Semantic Versioning for Evolution and Variability, they extend Java with a pure functional language, which is just there to show versions. So here we have a definition of a tiny little programming language. It has expressions and numbers in it, and that's it. Uh, but it also has version in it and these at init annotations on members. And those declare and mark the versions, respectively. And you don't have to understand all of this to follow. The key thing is that then, when we go to invoke this code, we can say, I'm going to invoke the version from init. And then, when I want to add a new backwards compatible API, I can introduce a new version which upgrades init. Maybe I introduce an add expression, and it has its own members on it for what the expressions are and the, the method and so on. And again, I call it using the version specifier, at v1 with new add. And again, I can do this with v2. Notably here, we're actually upgrading the original objects, the original class definitions. And here, our v1 code still type checks while calling this v2 code because they're truly backwards compatible. And the compiler checks that. If we tried to introduce something that wasn't available to v1, the compiler will say, hey, that, that actually isn't backwards compatible. I don't know about print. So I can't do this. You're going to have to make some kind of breaking change. So we could introduce a version v3, which upgrades versions 1 and 2, but replaces in it 
and adds this new definition to the original add expression. And now, once again, we can call v1, even though the v1 code itself doesn't have any knowledge of print. That's pretty cool, actually. And notice, this is the quote-unquote expression problem that actually they've made some traction on. This is cool. I don't think you should ship this. Uh, the programming overhead is significant, and the type checking overhead is significant. But I think it's really interesting to consider what it looks like to actually bake it into the compiler. And I would love to see somebody take these ideas from academia and say, what does it look like in an industrial language? How do we tackle usability here? Is there a way to make this ergonomic that it can just be baked in and then get the kinds of guarantees that Elm and Cargo Sember checks are trying to give us as part of the language from the start? OK, so we've covered some philosophy. We've looked at versioning schemes. We've seen kind of what some of the most interesting languages are doing in this space. But what should you do? Well, if you're an application developer, I think you should use something Semver-ish for your user-facing versions. It doesn't really have to be Semver, but this is pretty common at this point. So if you're going to drop support for an old operating system or you're going to fundamentally change the UI, call it a big major release and your users will thank you. Perhaps more importantly for kind of the context of this talk, think about the libraries and the tools that you use. Think really hard about what their versioning policies are. Are they implicit? Look at their history. What have they done in the past? And if they're explicit, look at the history and see what they've done in the past. Do they follow the contracts that they've set out? As an aside, I think having and really sticking with an explicit versioning policy, whatever it may be, but especially Semver, is actually a good signal for the quality, uh, or at least a dedication to quality from the authors of a given library. It's a thing I look for when evaluating. What about as a library author? What should you do? Well, this could have been the entire talk itself in some ways. Um, I want to give you a couple things to, to work on, but the number one is think about your versioning and go out of your way to communicate it so that people know what the contract is. Then use the tools. In Elm, you have to. If you're in Rust, use cargo sember checks. You don't technically have to, though hopefully someday you'll have to. But choose to reach for those tools if they exist. And if they don't, my joke about not yet having built it for TypeScript notwithstanding, think about building it because it could be a really valuable addition to whatever ecosystem you're working in. Also, these kinds of things are kind of fun to build because they're at that intersection of social dynamics and technical dynamics and compilers and communication. As a really practical matter, you want to keep your upgrades low coupling. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're a library, try to support more than one major version of your own major dependencies. This is more work, but if you think about the Python 2 to 3 upgrade, not being able to do this is one of the major things which made it take a decade because libraries had a very difficult time supporting both versions at once. If you as a library, if you're building on Tokyo in Rust or React in the front end or whatever the analogy might be, if you can support multiple major versions, that means people can upgrade your library and that key dependency that they also rely on separately which makes upgrades much, much easier for them. And let's extend that, talking about framework. If you're a framework author, you're a library author, but you have some additional responsibilities because your choices implicitly constrain the entire ecosystem around you. If you're React, what you choose to do with your versioning affects every React UI library out there. They have to build on top of you. So be extra explicit about your versioning scheme and what you're going to do and how you think about your policies here. More than that, you should design your policies with ecosystem evolution on top of you in mind. How do you make it possible for libraries to support more than one major version at the same time? If you're not thinking about it, you won't do it and you're gonna have upgrade problems to say the least. Related, 
you should make breaking changes both infrequent and, in my view, and this is pretty rare across the ecosystem, predictable. Put it on a schedule. Make it 18 months or five years or never, but make it predictable so that people know and can plan around it. I actually went out of my way working as part of the Ember Framework core team a couple of years ago that Ember does minor releases every six weeks already. It had been doing that for a decade. We put the cadence for major releases on an 18 month cycle because we wanted people to be able to plan and put it in their quarterly planning of, hey, there's an Ember major upgrade coming. We're going to want to absorb that. And this is the quarter we're going to absorb it in. That was really, really appreciated by that community. And I'd love to see more people doing that. Also, if you can make it automatable, when you do have breaking changes, please, please do. Uh, JavaScript and Rust in particular have been trying to invest in code mods, uh, cargo fix or ES fixes. I don't remember the name of the library now. Um, JS code shift, there we go. If you can make it easier for people to do those migrations, then minor to major versions become much less painful over time. And you should advise libraries to treat your framework as a peer dependency. NPM is the only ecosystem I know of that has this as an actual concept. But the idea is, again, people should be able to upgrade separately. And at the end of the day, you want the consuming app at the end of the chain to be the one that says, here's the version of React I got, or here's the version of Tokyo I got, or whatever the case may be. So if you set your own version constraints, as widely as possible as a library building on top of a framework, that makes it easier for the end application to upgrade those core framework dependencies as much as possible. Again, most things out there don't have any notion of this. In NPM ecosystem, you can use not NPM itself, unfortunately, but you can use Yarn or PNPM and they'll check this for you. Otherwise, a friend of mine wrote a tool called Validate Peer Dependencies, which you can install and it will check this for you. But give people advice on how to treat you as a framework for the sake of the end application developer. I just said all of this. <laughs> um, so finally, what should you do if you happen to be a programming language author? Well, number one, you need to consider versioning in your programming language design because as we saw earlier, the more complicated your type system is, the harder this gets. You should also, I think, build version aware tooling in as soon as possible. Cargo Semver checks is built on Rust documentation tool because it has to be and there's no other way to do it. If Rust exposed an API from early on to do this kind of thing, number one, Cargo Semver checks wouldn't have that problem, but number two, and also, maybe even just as compellingly, people would come up with other cool things to do with that. So if you can build it into your language framework tooling early, and maybe as we saw in that Java example, build it straight into the language, you can get a lot of mileage out of that and make your community's lives a lot easier later. Finally, I would love to see some languages actually bake peer dependency handling right into the language itself, into its tooling, into its own semantics. Because right now, in almost any ecosystem out there, the reality is it's just really hard to actually check your compatibility. If, if you want to say, as a library author, how do I check that I'm compatible against versions 1.1 through 1.30, how do I do that? Good luck. <laughs> uh, and likewise, how do application authors run testing to both say, here's the version I'm on currently, but I would also like to check against upcoming versions. If our language tooling and ecosystems can build these things in from the start, then it'll make everyone else's jobs a lot easier in that regard. It'll enable automation and CI to take advantage of these things. So, summing up, versioning is a form of communication, and specifically, I think it's a technical a socio-technical contract. So pick a policy. I think it should be Semver, but at least pick one and at least communicate it. Enforce it with whatever tools you can. Check it with whatever tools you can. Remember that you're never going to 100% get out of vibes territory, but check it if you can't. <laughs>
Uh, keep your upgrade coupling low. Let people upgrade separately. And let's build some new things because I do think there's a lot of room to push this stuff forward. Handling peer dependencies, thinking about language features, and so on. That's it, thank you. So we have time for some questions. Or comments or disagreements, go for it. Uh, what would your advice be um, considering the fact that the major version number is also a marketing tool? Mm -hmm. So I might want to increment it even though I remain compatible. I think we haven't figured that out yet is the honest answer. Um, Rust and Ember.js both tackle this via the idea of additions. And the idea there is that every so often you bundle up everything you've shipped in minor versions. Both of them have six week release cadences. Uh, and I'll focus on Rust here, which doesn't do breaking changes at all. Every so often, in Rust's case, every three years, we say, okay, we've shipped a lot of things by just delivering what's ready every six weeks. Now we're going to bring that all together in a coherent way. We're going to make sure all the documentation is updated. We're going to publicize this as Rust 2021 or 2024, et cetera. That helps some, but I can tell you that Ember tried that and the JavaScript ecosystem was like, what are you talking about? That's not what React does. It's not what Vue does. That's not what Svelte does. I think we do need to, if we're going to use Semver, think harder about how to decouple marketing from the breaking changes dynamics. Because one thing Ember does that I like is there are never any features in the major version, none. All it does is drop deprecated code, which is great, except then your market, everybody's like, Ember 5 came out and there's nothing in it. So I think it's mostly an unsolved problem that we need to get better at. More questions or comments? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So to summarize for the recording, et cetera, that is a weakness of Semver. Users expect more, not less, when the number goes up. And I would be interested to see something that tried to do what Semver does and changed the scheme in that way. I don't think anybody's taken a very serious swing at that, but it could be really useful for exactly that reason, to say, Number go up equal uh, new stuff for me, rather than just this, I have to think about the semantics of these things. Solover, in a lot of ways, is trying to do that, but doesn't communicate any of the other things that it needs to. Got about a minute and a half left, two minutes. Okay. Um. So is there uh, the idea around that the order is wrong for somewhere, namely that a patch might be a breaking change, but an API addition might actually be totally fine? So that the priority is just, do you need mm. to flip it ideally? That's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe. I, I noticed when I went to make the slide that covered the semantics, that I did actually have to flip the order because patch is kind of first and patch can be breaking. So there might, there really might be something to that. That's a great insight. I'm gonna be thinking about that over all of lunch. <laughs> well, if there's nothing else, uh, you can find this talk. It'll be on speaker deck and my website, chriscreitcher.com. I'm working consulting right now, but I'm also open to other, other jobs and roles. So if you have something that's kind of building ratchets to help us make better software, come, come talk to me. I'd love to chat with you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>